<laughs> Good morning, and afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explore Classroom Hangout. My name is Joe Gorowski from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. If you've been following along this month, you know we are in our final week of our February celebration of amazing women in science, exploration, adventure, and conservation. It's been a ton of fun, and we still have a few more events coming up this month. But before we meet today's guest, we're gonna take a little moment and jump onto National Geographic's Mapmaker Interactive and get a feel for where everyone is joining us from today. So just give me a moment to share my screen. There we go, and I'll pull up the map. So I am here in Canada in Alora, Ontario at the Red X. And if we start to back up a little more, you'll see we don't have any classrooms on camera with us uh, in Canada today, but our classrooms are joining us from New York and Connecticut, um, Illinois, Arkansas, Louisiana, New Mexico, and Colorado. And if we go right out to the West Coast, you can see where our guest is joining us from Seattle, Washington today. So as I come back from that screen share, I just want to remind any classroom who's tuning in live via YouTube, you can still get in on the action. Uh, let us know where you're watching from in the chat sidebar on the right, and then uh, fire off a couple questions for us, and we'll be sure to work some of those questions into the presentation. And then, of course, any classroom, whether you're live on camera with us or you are watching on YouTube, take some pictures, post them on Twitter, use the hashtag explore classroom and tag at Nat Geo Education because we love to see classrooms in action. So today, Jamina Garland-Lewis is joining us. Jamina is a National Geographic Young Explorer grantee whose recent work focused on documenting the stories and images of the last living former whalers in the Azores. She's a photographer, biologist and explorer with a background in conservation biology, global health and documentary storytelling. Her experiences have taken her to 29 countries across six continents. Both her research and photography explore the connections between humans, animals, and their shared environments. So Jamina, it's so great to be stealing some of your time again today. We're really excited to hear a little bit about you. And of course, we'll be firing questions at you later. Thank you so much, Joe, um, for that intro, and thank you to all the classrooms. Um, it's so great to have you um, here today. Um, I'm so excited to be with you guys and hear your questions. So um, first, just a little bit about me, and then I'll go into a screen share and share some of my, my photographs and work with you guys and my story. Um, so like Joe said, I'm a National Geographic Explorer um, and photographer and um, an eco-health researcher is, is the type of science that I do. Um, and I think a photographer probably makes a lot of sense to everybody. Um, we know what that is, but eco-health researcher is a little more weird and unusual. So what that means um, is that I look at different types of relationships between humans, animals, and the environments, like Joe said in my intro. Um, specifically, I look a lot as a scientist um, with issues surrounding health and disease. Um, and so maybe look at uh, the different types of diseases that can go back and forth between people and animals or how environmental health might impact uh, disease emergence, um, how animals can, can make us more healthy in our lives, all these sorts of things. Um, and as a photographer, I sort of focus on a lot of those same issues um, and how we connect to animals and how we connect to our environments. So I am going to hope this works. Um, do, do, do. Give me one second here to get this going. And then... All right, looks good so far, and we see. Uh, am I a baby? We got gotcha. you. Okay, perfect. All right, so I'm going to start uh, way back here. Um, so this is me, and uh, for that classroom in New Mexico. Hey guys, because this is <laughs> that's where I grew up. Um, so I'm glad you're here with us today. Um, so this is me uh, being a little kid wandering around outside, and this is really where my relationship um, to the outdoors started, and. Um, and where, I mean, really where it's brought me today started this young. So I was really fortunate to have parents who let me roam around outside and be curious and explore and really start to, to get excited about the outdoors and nature um, and be curious. And that was really a big part of my life. Um, and it continued 
Uh, it's continued ever since, but in high school, this is, uh, I was probably just a little bit older than you guys here. I think I had just turned 15. Uh, this is in Glacier National Park. This was the first camera I ever had. So I started doing photography actually when I was about 12. Um, I just loved it. And this is really, um, this is really when I started to see photography as a way that I could communicate um, to, to other people, um, you know, what my, my experience was in the outdoors and with nature and what I was learning um, and maybe some issues of, of conservation and wildlife and, and photography was starting to be a way that I, I really wanted to do that. Um, and then this is me within the last year or so. As you can see, not much has changed me in the outdoors um, forever. And I anticipate I'll be a really old lady with some similar pictures like this as well. Um, and so that connection um, my whole life um, to wanting to be outside and, and understand nature is a huge part of, of what got me where I am just going outside and seeing what's out there. Um, but there are a couple things that really played a big role in, um, in the type of science that I do today and the type of, of art that I do today as well. And so this is in Uganda. Um, this is uh, a male silverback mountain gorilla. Um, and this was, uh, I saw this incredible animal um, when I was in college. Um, I was doing research about uh, disease transmission between people and the mountain gorillas. And so the mountain gorillas are critically endangered animals. Um, there's very few of them left and they only live in this tiny part of East Africa. Um, and because uh, they're so closely related to us, um, they can get our diseases really easily. And it's something that people might not think about a lot. Like maybe you guys have heard or know of some, some diseases that an animal could give a person, maybe like rabies um, is a big one that people know about. Um, but we don't necessarily think about the fact that sometimes people can make animals sick too. Um, and, and that's a really big deal, especially in places like this where you have an endangered species that is um, you know, really particularly uh, able to get that human disease. And so the only real approach um, in working in these sorts of places is to make sure that you have people focusing on human health, um, working with conservation biologists. And that's a little bit of a funny thing for, for a lot of people in these fields traditionally, because uh, those two things haven't, we haven't thought about how much we're interconnected historically, but we really are. And so this was the first time um, that I got to work on a project where um, if you improve the health of the people in these communities that live really close to the gorillas or the park rangers um, who, are, who are going out and working in the park and the tourists who are coming to see the gorillas make sure that they're healthy when they come, then that means that the, the gorillas will stay healthy as well. They won't get those diseases. Um, and then that brings in more money through tourism into these communities and into the park service for preservation of these environments. And so it's really a win-win-win for everybody. Um, and that just really was important to me to see, um, see these interconnectedness and to be working with scientists from different areas um, really coming together on a project. So that was really when I first got into this field, what we call eco-health or one health. Um, and then the other big thing that um, sort of put me on this trajectory and got me working with National Geographic, um, I'm sorry, this is a little small, but... Um, I had a fellowship the year after I finished college um, where I spent a year traveling by myself um, to seven different countries to look at different cultural relationships to whales and to whaling um, and how uh, different people throughout time have, have included whales in their culture, um, whether it's in religion or as food or their economy in some other way like whale watching. Um, and so I went to countries, all different kinds of countries for that. And that's where I first um, ended up in the Azores, which is that blue pin in the middle of the ocean, um, in the middle of the North Atlantic. So in between North America and Europe, right in the middle of the ocean there, that's the Azores. So they're pretty out of the way, but they're pretty amazing. And they're Portuguese islands. Um, and... Whaling was a really big deal there um, up until the mid 1980s, but they did it out of these boats that you see here, which are seven man wooden canoes. 
um, and not necessarily what people associate um, with whaling, um, especially what's still happening in today's world. And so they had such a, a different story there um, that when I was there during this fellowship, um, I came back and was still thinking about it a lot. And so I proposed to National Geographic um, if I could go back and um, photograph the former whalers, the last ones who were alive, um, and, and interview them about their stories. Um, and so that is what I got to do. Um, and I'm very, very grateful that Geographic supported me in that because um, it's been a project I've been working on for about 11 years now. Um, and I've been back to the islands a few times um, to keep doing this work. And so I'd talk to these men um, and photograph them because really no one else alive has any stories like them. Um, you know, like I said, they were in these small boats. Um, they were hunting sperm whales, which are some of the largest animals on earth, um, out of these little boats, just, um, you know, with a hand harpoon lance. Like if you guys know anything about whaling in America and like the um, 1800s, a long time ago, that's what people were doing then. And so to have it continue into even my lifetime, um, they were still whaling in my lifetime, um, is pretty crazy. And nobody has stories like that anymore because it was a pretty, uh, pretty intense job. I'm glad that nobody has to do it anymore. Um, but these, they have important stories about their culture and their history. Um, and nobody had really um, recorded them before. And so that's why I, I wanted to go back. And now what I focus on a little bit more over time is the younger generation, people who are more my age, um, how they are keeping their culture intact um, uh, with once the whaling has ended. So this is that same boat that they used to hunt the whales from, but now they're using it for, for sport. They do rowing and sailing races with them, and they're a really big deal. Um, different islands come to compete against each other. They have really big festivals during the summer, um, and it's a really powerful way that the younger generation, many of whom you know have have fathers or grandfathers who were whalers, um, to still connect to their their community and their culture, but no longer have to kill whales as part of it. And so that's what I look at more now. Um, but also, I sometimes I just want to, you know, do something else and, and have a little fun. And I recommend that to you guys as well. Make sure even if you're doing out, go out there doing work you love, take a break sometimes. Go climb a volcano like I did here and, and look out and just take a break and, and have that spirit of adventure wherever you are as well. Um, so after I first finished up um, my first round of of interviews and photographs for, for National Geographic in the Azores, I decided to go to graduate school. Um, I was really focused on, uh, like I said, this these connections between human health and animal health, um, and uh, know that I needed to, to go to school if I wanted to, to have the skills to do more in that field. Um, and this was really important for me as a photographer as well, because um, it's actually it's hard to be just a great photographer anymore because camera, everybody has a camera and we're really used to seeing lots of images a lot more than we used to be even 10 years ago. And so um, it's important um, a lot of the times, depending on what type of photography you want to do, um, that you also have some other, some other skills um, that, that te tells you different stories um, that another photographer might know, gives you a different perspective on how to shoot that story, gives you contacts or networks or access. Um, and those are all important things. So I knew that not only as a scientist, graduate school made sense, but also as a photographer so that I could know more about the, the stories that I wanted to tell as a photographer in addition to work as a researcher. Um, and so I uh, actually worked in a little bit of a different thing for my master's work. Um, I worked in, in Tanzania and East Africa, but I was working more with uh, agriculture, small scale ag agriculture and disease and childhood nutrition. And so this was part of work in Tanzania that I did for that. Um, so a little bit of a, a different thing, but still looking at that um, relationship between, between animals and humans. Um, and so I wanna share a little bit about some of the more recent work that I've been doing with you guys. Um, and so since I finished um, graduate school over five years ago now, 
Um, I've been working at um, a place called the Center for One Health Research at the University of Washington here in Seattle. Um, and I work with a team who focuses on these, these issues of the health and disease connections between people and animals and the environment. And so uh, recently, a couple, well, I guess a couple years ago now, we uh, went to Thailand for some work we do. So um, as an example of some of the projects, uh, this is one where this community has um, a forest preserve here for these monkeys. Um, these are long-tailed macaques. And, um, but the, the forest reserve they have is a little bit too small for how many monkeys they have. Um, and they like to feed the monkeys. As you can see, this is a park ranger who's part of his job is to bring bananas to the monkey every day. But people in the community like to come feed the monkeys too, um, either for fun or for spiritual reasons. Um, and um, so, they're, the monkey population is getting a little crazy. And so they're wandering out of this forest and uh, getting into people's homes, getting into their refrigerators, taking their underwear and running out of the house. I heard all sorts of crazy stories about monkeys. Um, and so we're looking at, um, you know, sort of from a, a conservation and a human health perspective, um, how, how the human monkey conflict in this area is changing as, as this population grows and what maybe we could do about that to keep the monkeys and the people safe together. Um, and so this is just a, a photo I want to share because it tells a little bit of the sometimes less glamorous side of, of field research and science. Um, and uh, so I, like I said, the monkeys do some crazy things and this was um, an adult male monkey um, who got into some of our stuff one day. And I should tell you guys that um, a lot of what I have to do as a scientist um, is talk about poop and collect poop and study what we can learn from poop. And so it doesn't gross me out anymore because I've realized how much incredible information you can actually learn from poop. Um, but so what this meant for our work in Thailand is that we had collections from the, the humans that we were talking to, the people in the community. We had some of their poop and we had some monkey poop. And we were going to look at the two, compare them to see if they had any parasites um, that were shared between them. And that would tell us a little bit more about the disease overlap. But this monkey got into our stuff, found our little container of poop, opened it, smelled it, was disgusted by it, rightly so, and then dumped it out all over the sidewalk and we had to clean it up. Um, so this is right before that happened. And so that is, uh, it's funny in retrospect, but it wasn't exactly then. So this is some of the weird things you can find yourself doing when you work in this type of research. Um, and then a little bit more recently, this was my most recent work, um, I got to go to Papua New Guinea for the first time, which was really exciting for me. Um, and I got to work with a group of tree kangaroo biologists who've been working in this conservation area in Papua New Guinea for over 20 years, um, but who want to start doing more to incorporate human health um, projects into their conservation measures and looking at these, these connections, again, between human health and conservation, which is really important here in an area that... You know, this is so remote. It's the most remote place I've ever been. Um, there's no roads anywhere near here. If you wanted to get to the next big city, you'd have to walk for five days. Um, some people do do that in order so they can sell like their fruits and vegetables at market. Um, but we came in via this little plane. Um, and there's a couple airstrips in the whole conservation area um, that you can land in. And so I want to share a little bit of that moment with you. I hope this works well. Um, so I got to sit right up front in our little plane and have one tiny flat spot. But that was getting there, and that was one of the most most adventurous times getting anywhere I've ever had. Um, and so what we were doing there was um, really just the first parts of a project where we look at, okay, what are 
the different types of interactions people have with animals so that we we know that first and then we can can move on from that and um and so we look at both domestic animals like you can see this pig here um pigs are a really important part of their culture um and this pig was um uh, they were getting ready to just to uh, shoot it with a bow and arrow as, as is their tradition um, for a big dinner for the whole community um, and us the night that we um, our last night in the area. And so we look at, you know, the ways that people live with things like pigs and chickens um, and pets and other communities, um, but also wildlife. And so people hunt wildlife here, but they also will sometimes take them in as pets. So this was a cockatoo that had a broken wing. So some the teacher had found it and it lived with him now. Um, this is a mountain cuscus. Um, they do hunt this animal and they eat it. And this one was healthy, but they just decided they wanted to keep this one as a pet instead. So we're learning about all these different types of, of relationships people have with animals in their ecosystem. Um, and then we can go on and design a further study. Um, so hopefully we'll be back in the next year to do more of that. Um, I also, so Papua New Guinea and Thailand are very far away from where I live in Seattle. Um, and I love traveling internationally for work, but I think it's also really important to do work in your community. Um, and so I want to share just a little bit about this project. It's a little bit different, um, but it's also a great example of how photography and uh, science and some other uh, different disciplines can work together. And so this is a project I've worked on for about five years in Seattle, in my own community. Um, it's a project on people who are experiencing homelessness with their pet and the bond that they share with that animal while they're homeless and how that animal can really help them out during that difficult situation. Um, and so I, I photograph um, people and I interview them for this project. Um, but we also have been able to use that photography as a base to do a number of other things uh, for this community. And so recently we've been able to start up what we call a One Health Clinic, um, where homeless youth are able to see a doctor, but also their pet is able to see a veterinarian at the same place. So they'll go, they'll see the doctor and check in and make sure that they're doing okay. And then they can bring their pet to the veterinarian and, and get their pet Pet checked out and that's a really big deal because people will generally put their pets care in front of their own and so it's helping us um, see more more homeless youth for their own care as well and that's a big deal so um, there's a, that clinical part of it and then um, this is me teaching you can see some of my photography on the screens um, so I teach a course every spring at the University of Washington just three sessions um, as a guest um, that is built off of the website for this project um, that I've done as a photographer. And so it engages these students with people in their community, their stories. Um, they have to, to work with the photography and the storytelling in order to answer questions about the research we want to do and um, take action in their community. They actually get to pro propose things for projects we're working on. Um, and so this is a, a big thing for me. And so this is, again, a great example of how um, even though sometimes people think they don't work together, you can have photography and science and education all blend and work really well to support each other. They all have different strengths, um, but you can really use them to support each other. And that's personally my little sweet spot of, of those three worlds. Um, and the last thing I wanna share with you guys um, is that even though um, I am a scientist and I have my own projects, I love contributing to other scientists work as well um, in ways that I can through something called citizen science. And I don't know if you guys have heard about that or are already involved in some projects maybe, but it's something you guys can absolutely do even as students, even if you grow up and are, don't have anything to do with being a scientist, you can still participate in citizen science and help other researchers out there get data that they need that they otherwise wouldn't be able to get without you. And so um, some of the projects that I've helped on on that that are important to me um, is here collecting microplastics um, from the ocean to help out a big study on global plastics pollution. Um, and you know, for me, plastics is one of the most important One Health issues because we know that it negatively impacts 
um, wildlife in our ecosystems, it impacts the environment negatively. And we're starting to see how it can impact humans negatively as well as we start to ingest more of it through the food we eat. And so um, this is a really big, important one for me, and I'm happy to participate in, in lending a hand on this research, even though it's not specifically my own. Um, and then this summer recently as well, I love to find ways that I can can help while also doing the things that I love as well. So I got to work on a butterfly um, project this summer um, here in Washington, close to my home. Um, so we can, butterflies can tell us a lot about climate change and biodiversity. So I got to help work on that um, in these incredible places. Um, this is where I camped for the night doing this research. Um, and you know, it's this is basically my backyard. It's not technically my backyard because I live in Seattle, but it's it's a few hours away. And so, to get a chance to to again keep on with that connection I have to the outdoors, to be outside, but also to help out with with important conservation science at the same time. I love those opportunities, and I encourage you guys to find some as well in your communities because they're definitely out there. So um, I am gonna cut it at that for now because I'm super excited to hear your questions um, and yeah thank you guys so much all right thank you so much Jamina that was awesome uh, thanks for sharing some of your story and as well uh, how you're able to make kind of those dis those different disciplines work together looks like it's working out for you and you're having fun doing it all right well classrooms just a reminder that the microphones aren't really cooperating today so i can put you on mute but i can't unmute you so i'm going to start introducing the classrooms when i introduce your classroom if your teacher can just turn the mic on for me um you guys can say hi and then go ahead uh, with a question so let's get started let us start with mrs baker's group joining us in colorado looks like she has multiple students from grades five through eight let's get their microphone turned on if you guys can turn it on and say hi for us Hi. Hi. Hey, Colorado, how are you? Um, hi, my name is Scarlett. I'm in seventh grade. My question is, what is the most memorable place you've been to and why? Oh, golly. Okay. <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to, oh, I should, I should, okay, let's see. Um, I think so. There are um, there are probably about a million answers I could have for this question, um, depending <laughs> on on. I think they're all going to keep popping up at different moments. But I do want to think about this on my own a bit too. But um, I will say um, the the top of that volcano that I shared with you guys from that photo in the Azores. Um, that was a really important moment for me for several reasons. Um, one was that um, I'd been working on the islands for a number of years. And um, so there's, I work on an island that is across from that island that has the volcano. And it's the volcano just like rises out of nowhere on this island. It goes so high. Um, and so I'd been staring at it from across on my island for years. Um, and I'd always been looking at it and always wanted to go up. Um, and um, it's actually the highest point in Portugal um, and in along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So that sort of underwater mountain range that you have in the Atlantic, that one actually goes up so high that it's the highest point in that. Um, and so finally getting up there was, was really special. Um, and just to see the island I live on as this tiny little, it kind of looks like a turtle from, from up there. Um, so that was really special. But the other thing that made it really memorable was that um, I got, so you get up to the top of the volcano and you're in a big crater and that's where you put your tent. But then there's a little, it's called a cinder cone and it's about another 300 feet um, that's in this one little part of the crater. And so to get to the actual highest part, you have to climb up that too. And so I'd set up my tent and then I, I climbed up the cinder cone um, for, for sunset and I got up to the top and I saw a plastic straw. And I was thinking, how on earth did a plastic straw make it all the way up to the top of this volcano in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean? Um, and it really just um, was a reminder of, of how bad um, our problem with plastics pollution is. 
um, and really um, got me uh, sort of <laughs> excited and um, angry in a good way to, to talk more about plastics pollution and the ways that we can uh, can do things in our own lives um, to help help make that better because I don't want to go out to a volcano in the middle of the ocean and find a plastic straw. It's, it's not good for anybody. So that was a really memorable experience for that. All right. Great question to start us off. And just a reminder to any classrooms who are tuning in via YouTube, use the chat sidebar on the right and let us know where you're watching from and send in some questions. But for now, we're going to go to our classroom in Las Lunas, New Mexico. Um, looks like some third graders hanging out with us with Mrs. Nilvo. If you want to turn your mic on and say hi, uh, then we'd love to steal one of your questions. Hi. Hi. All right. Hello from School of Dreams Academy. My name is Camila. And my name is Hunter. Why did you choose a degree of conservation medicine? How do you use this degree? Oh, those are good questions. Um, so conservation medicine is another term for eco health or one health. It gets a little confusing because they're all pretty much the same, but a little bit different if you actually work in the field. So conservation medicine, um, is a, is a type of one health that has a little bit more focus on conservation biology. Um, so if we think about sort of human health and animal health and the environment sort of all overlapping, that part in the middle um, is one health, but everybody kind of comes at it from their own circle to begin with. And so my circle that I was coming from was more conservation biology because um, as an undergraduate in college, my, that was what my degree was in, was biology and environmental studies. And so I had already been thinking a lot about conservation biology. And so for me, um, having a program that was really looking, that had a focus on, um, on conservation when you start to bring in human health and animal health and all that, that was really important to me. Um, and it was actually the first, um, first graduate program in the US um, in it specifically in that field as well. So I, um, I didn't have like a, ton of different options to choose from at that point. There's getting to be a lot more. And by the time you guys are are looking at those sorts of programs in your life, I hope there will be many, many options for you to choose from. Um, but that's why I chose that. And then how I, I use it, um, man, I mean, I, I think it informs uh, probably a, a lot of how I, I think about the world in addition to the work I do. So you know, for work, uh, in a practical sense, the degree got me a job at the university that I work at in order to do the type of research I do. Um, and so that's helped me that way. Um, that's how I use it. But in a, in a bigger sense, um, it really has helped me understand how connected we are to animals and to our environment um, and to help uh, bring down these ideas that conservation doesn't involve humans or that it's somewhere else far away or that we don't really have a role to play or um, so it's really helped me understand how we all are interconnected and how our health does depend on the health of our environment and and does depend on the health of these animals and so that's been a really important way um, just about how I see the world and how I think about issues in a more you know in a more integrated together way than separate so that I think that's been really important too. Great. All right. Let's get another microphone turned on. We're going to go to Chicago, Illinois this time. We have some grade five sixes hanging out with Mrs. Askovich. If you want to turn your microphone on, say hi, and then fire away with a question. Say hi. 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 Okay. And Josie, you can ask your question. Uh, what is your favorite part about science and why? Ooh. <sighs> so. I have always been curious, as you might have been able to tell from that picture of me as a, a little kid. Um, I, uh, I've never been bored, I don't think, because there's just so much to see and learn about the world. Um, and science is an incredible way for me to um, pursue that curiosity. Um, 
even if it's not particularly a field that I work in, I'm always excited to, to learn more about what science can tell us and what people are, are learning um, about the world. Um, and so um, I think for me, my favorite thing about science is, is just that it, it makes me really giddy to learn more about the way the world works. Um, I, I'm a huge nerd and I think I wear that proudly. Um, and um, I think that um, it's, it's okay to follow that curiosity. It's okay to be a nerd, um, to, to want to learn more about the world work, how the world works, um, because it's really freaking cool. Um, and so um, I think that, uh, and there's always more, we're always learning more. And I think that science also tells us um, that we're never always sure about anything. There's always still room for growth and furthering our understanding. And I, I really love that about science as well. So yeah, another great question. Perfect. And a good answer as well. Science is pretty awesome. Yeah. All right. Let's go to, where should we go next? Let's go to Mrs. Baker's grade sixes. They're in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. If you want to turn your mic on for me and say hi, and then fire away with a question. Hi. 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 My name is Camille Moore from Sherwood Middle, and I would like to ask, did your family life experiences or past teachers influence your science career? Ooh. Absolutely, 100%. Um, uh, and in really important ways. Um, so I, I talked a little bit about my family, um, uh, just really, sort of letting me explore and supporting my curiosity. And I think that's huge. I think you need people in your life to support um, your curiosity because um, sometimes, especially as children, and I hope this is changing, but sometimes um, people who are interested in sciences um, aren't seen as cool or have a hard time um, finding ways to, to really um, be supported in that, that curiosity. Um, and so family and teachers play a really big role in that. And I was fortunate um, in that way for sure. Um, my mom sacrificed a lot for me to, to be in good schools and to support that. Um, and so I'm really grateful for that. And then um, teachers, um, the two most influential teachers for me, um, both in high school was my photography teacher and my biology teacher, not, not terribly surprisingly perhaps, but um, and I still, I'm still in touch with them to this day, you know, um, 15 years later, um, after, uh, finishing high school and, um, still sort of sharing my work with them and, um, being, you know, wanting to hear about how things are going for them. They've both retired at this point, but, um, I think people who can help build that spark and help support you, um, for me as a photographer, as a young photographer, one thing that was really important about my teacher was that he he saw that I had a passion and a desire um, for photography and he let me really move forward with some of my own projects that I wanted to work on rather than forcing me into the um, all of the exact syllabus assignments. Um, and really gave me some creative space in that way, even as a young photographer, to pursue what I wanted to do. So I, um, and still learn those same lessons he was hoping to get across in the syllabus assignments. But, um, and so that was important too. So I think there's a balance between, um, you know, giving people opportunities, but how you do that as well to, to really kindle their, their passion um, and make them feel sufficient in it. And so that was, that was an important teacher for me for that reason too. All right. Mrs. Tishkoff's class there in Woodbury, Connecticut. Connecticut. Hanging out with <laughs> if you want to say hi. 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 Hey. In your opinion, what is the most interesting interaction between humans and animals? Ooh. Ooh. Um, I think, um, I think potentially, um, 
culturally uh, how we relate to different animals in different ways. So, um, you know, in we have set certain boundaries around um, animals depending on our culture in terms of, you know, what is an animal that we have as a pet um, or culturally maybe even if the, the idea of a pet exists, there are many places in the world where that kind of relationship that we might have with our cat or dog um, in America, that kind of relationship with an animal doesn't really exist in the same way. Um, what we eat, um, you know, we have certain animals that um, we think are, are fine to eat in this country that maybe in other places don't think that or they think it's okay to eat animals that we don't. Um, religious or spiritual connections. Um, and I think it's fascinating how those are, are different throughout the world. Um, and, and in, you know, working with my community here with the Homelessness Project, really seeing how powerful um, uh, a source of friendship and companionship um, and really a way to turn people's life around an animal can be like that type of love that a, a people get from a dog um, uh, in, in, again, in our culture uh, is quite, quite different um, from what people have received from humans. And I think that's fascinating um, in the ways that a, an animal might be able to support us in our physical health or our mental health that other people sometimes um, can't do or can't do in quite the same way. Um, so that's been a really powerful thing for me to see. Um, and I also think there are just some really ridiculous things that happen like I, the, with those monkeys, um, you know, all sorts of crazy stories. Somebody also said that their monkey came in and put, used their lipstick and put it all over their face and then ran out. And it's like animals do some really funny things too. Um, so there's some really important things and then some very silly things. And I like watching all of those. Very cool. All right, good question as well. We're gonna take a jump to another classroom. Mrs. Holland's group, grade seven's hanging out in Bentonville, Arkansas. If you guys wanna turn on your mic and say hi nice and loud and then go ahead with the question. All right. Uh, Bud, can you try and come nice and close for us? Your microphone's really quiet. I can't hear it. You kind of hear it a little bit. It's going to sound weird, but can you get really close to the microphone? <laughs> wherever, wherever you think it is on the computer. Um, are you going on a project soon that you haven't been on before? Or like, are you going somewhere soon that you haven't been before? Um, oh, perfect. Great question. Um, I am, so I just got back from two places that I hadn't been before, which was Papua New Guinea and Chile. Um, but I'm home for a little bit now, actually, but the next, um, the next big trips I have coming up are in June in Alaska and I get to work as, um, a naturalist and photographer on the National Geographic, um, ships that they do. And, and so... Um, I've been to Alaska, but it was a really long time ago, and I'm super excited to learn more about that area. Um, it's one of the most beautiful places. The wildlife there is incredible. Um, so it's going to be a great opportunity to talk about conservation and our environment um, and work with other National Geographic scientists and photographers on board um, and, and help teach the guests that are on those ships about those things as well. And so I'm super looking forward to, to that time in this summer. All right, and we'll visit our final live camera classroom. Um, they are joining us from New York. We have Mrs. Lennon's group, uh, some high school school students hanging out with us. If you guys want to turn on the mic and say hi, yeah. and then go ahead with your question. Oh, it's on. Hi, my name is Chalice Luciano. This is the 12th grade class at Columbia oh. High School. <laughs> In New York City, Bella's question is, how do you decide where you're going to travel to? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, in a weird way, I I don't actually know that I frequently get to decide where I travel to. Um, I think there are places of the world that I um, maybe try to prioritize looking for opportunities for. I've done um, 
a lot of work in um, sub-Saharan Africa and in sort of the Australia, um, New Zealand, Oceania area. Um, but a lot of the times, because um, because I don't personally have uh, you know money falling off trees, um, I have to find these opportunities through work or through school. Um, and so I did a, a lot of hard work as a student um, to sort of find opportunities that could help me um, get out and exploring. Um, and then work is kind of similar. Um, I, um, I get assignments places um, or projects come up because of connections that we have. Um, and in, in a way, I, I kind of like that better than just choosing myself because um, it's taken me to places that I don't know that I ever would have um, gotten on my own. Um, and I've been so grateful for the opportunity to, to see something new um, and to learn about new places um, all the time. And so, um, yeah, I there are certainly, again, there are some regions that I focus on, but um, a lot of the time I don't necessarily know where I'm going to end up. And I think that's true for a lot of, a lot of photographers um, because we kind of get sent rent different places at the last minute a lot of the time. So, um, but uh, I'm, I'm excited to, to explore anywhere. I don't think there's hardly anywhere in the world that I wouldn't want to go see and learn about. So I take it as it comes. I'm just always excited for the next adventure wherever it is. All right, awesome. Well, uh, Jamina, just before we wrap up for today, um, what's a good way, because I know classrooms definitely have more questions, what's a good way for them to reach out? Is there a Twitter or an Instagram where they could maybe shoot some more questions at you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I'm not on Twitter, um, but Instagram is a great way to reach out. Um, email is fine too. Um, my Instagram handle is my first name um, and then my middle name Rose. So it's just at Jamina Rose. Um, and then, yeah, Joe, you can share, share my email and that with folks and I'd be more than happy to, to answer any other questions you guys have. Perfect. So just one really quick question from our online community from VJ in India. Uh, they're wondering if you would recommend if you're taking a zoology course to take photography as well. Oh, <laughs> um, I would say if you're interested in photography, you should take a photography course as well. Um, but um, yeah, I think uh, if if you're interested in both zoology and photography and unsure how to decide between the two, which was basically what I kind of spent most of my life doing, I kind of spent a lot of time in the sciences and then a lot of time as a photographer. And I kept thinking, these are different careers. I'm going to have to choose one. Um, and I, I think that is... Um, not true. I, I know so many people, particularly through National Geographic, that have found really incredible ways to, to be zoologists or conservation biologists or other forms of scientists, as well as photographers or filmmakers or other visual storytellers. Um, and it's a little bit harder because there's no like set career path for you laid out, um, but it's really important. And so if you are interested in zoology and you want to share that interest with other people, you want to talk about issues and get um, get more people involved um, in the science than just the scientific community. Uh, photography is an incredible way to do that, um, and you can absolutely do both both things. All right, excellent. Well, uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us today, uh, Jamina. That was great. Any teachers who would like your uh, email address, just shoot me a message after the hangout, and I can make sure to get it your way if you want to fire away some more questions. A quick reminder that we still do have a couple more events coming up this month. So if you go to nationalgeographic.org and under education, you'll find Explorer Classroom. Tomorrow at two Eastern, we're hanging out with Jess Cramp, who's gonna talk about her shark conservation work in the Cook Islands. And then on the 27th at 2 p.m., we're hanging out with Dalal Hanna, who's gonna talk about some of her ecology work uh, studying rivers. So once again, classrooms, that was awesome. I'm gonna turn your microphones on in just one second. Or actually, you're gonna have to turn your microphones on and get nice and loud and say goodbye and thank you. But again, uh, Jamina, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you.